Amen. So John, I mean, John chapter 9, let me come down here and talk. John chapter 9, um, we're going to share there that God would just speak to us. And um, before we go there, just a couple of things I want to share with you by way of introduction, and then we can just let God move and have his way in our midst. Do me a favor and turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, um, you have been called to minister in your place of deliverance. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, turn to your other neighbor. Come on, say other neighbor. You have been called to minister in your place of deliverance. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, w- I want you all to, to flesh it out and press it out with me because as we go into the text, um, one of, before we go into the text, one of the things that I feel it's important that we understand that you not miss the truth that God has brought you out and brought me out so we can go back in, right? He's delivered us. He set us free. He's brought us into a relationship with him. But his whole goal and premise is that we're not just saved uh, for the mere pleasure of just calling him Savior. And I oftentimes say this, just wait for the rapture to take place, depending on your theology of the rapture, and we go to be with him. And meantime, we're just waiting for the trip. There's work to do while we're here. Come on, there's work to do. It's very, very important that we understand that. And especially on the back end of the past few weeks, we've been talking about the body being one and having many members and the importance of the spiritual gifts, being the Spirit of God in us. I want to put some legs to that this morning to say, what does that look like with me using my spiritual gifts, with me being engaged with God, with me working where God would have me to be? And I think a great starting place is for us to understand biblically and spiritually what it means for me to minister at my place of deliverance. And don't miss the point that I'm just making a starting point because as you continue to grow and mature to be who God would have you to be, there's always shifts that take place where God would give you a different assignment. Amen? So very, very important for you to know that. I, I said this morning that this church isn't called, in case you didn't notice, you, you hear this song and dance all the time if you attend here, that this church is not called Restoration Christian Fellowship by accident. It's Katani, my wife and my place of deliverance where God restored us. You kind of get what I'm saying? And because of what he did, our ministry is in our place of deliverance. You get it? We don't run from it. We stay there to be what God would have us to be. If you were to look uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, right? Now, I'm not saying go to but if you were to look there, you would find the story where it says um, there's a war going on in heaven um, and the Michael, the archangel, and the angels of heaven are warring against the satanic and demonic influences. And the text pointedly says, if you read um, that text onward from chapter 12, that Michael and the angels won and defeated the enemy, and he was thrown out of heaven. But what's pivotal in that passage is where verse 11 says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their what? Oh my gosh, that's so critical. Your testimony has value. It means something. When we can tell someone what God has done for us, where God has brought us from, it helps that person. It strengthens them. It enables them to go on and be who God would have them to be. But we must be able to talk and share our testimony so we can see who God would have us to be. The text we're confronted with in the book of John chapter 9, I think it's a great passage of scripture that I want to use this morning just to highlight a few points and hopefully encourage you and to show you how this individual, God delivered him from where he was and called him at the same time to begin his earthly ministry in the place of deliverance. So as we look at this text, I want to read the first four, I mean, first eight verses to give you a little bit of literary context before we get into what we're going to be talking about with the passage. Now, as usual, Jesus is going about his earthly ministry, and then he encounters this man that was born blind. So let me read the text and let's talk through it so we can see what God is saying. If you're there, say amen, um, verse 1 of chapter 9. Let me hear you say amen if you're there. It opens up by saying this, as he passed by, being Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Notice verse 3, Jesus' response. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
Then verse 4 says, we must work, works, uh, work the works of him who sent me while it is day for night coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, here's what he says, I am the light of the world. Before we move into the text, there's a couple of things that we must point out that will give us a great foundation to build the rest of today's message on. When you look at biblical scripture, this is one of probably the only instances or the first instance at least mentioned in scripture of Jesus now healing an individual where his defect in life or his issue in life was not something that happened subsequent to his birth or something that happened to him along his spiritual journey while he's walking on the earth. The text is very clear. It says the man was born with the condition which he found himself in. So what is it saying, preacher? That it's clear where it says he was born blind. Come on, say he was born blind. Born blind. Now, the reason I want to point that out is because if you were to check the Decalogue or go back to the book of Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5, you would find scenarios where the text is clear after Jesus gave the Ten Commandments and began to teach about that a little bit. Here is what he said. He says that um, if you uh, obey my word, there's blessing. If you miss it, then it, it quotes it this way. The sins of the fathers are transferred on to the third and fourth generation. Now, why am I, why am I making that statement? Because the Jewish culture then took that statement literally and they went about doing church, doing ministry, doing their Bible work, doing theology with that framework that if a person is on the face of the earth and they have an ailment, that ailment must be due to some sin that existed in the life of their forefathers. And so when they saw this man, the default nature of Jewish culture is that by virtue of the fact that he was born blind, sin must exist in his life. Sin must exist in his family life. Sin must have been there from his parents. So they raised the question to Jesus. Here's what they said. Hey, Jesus, who sinned? Is it this man or did his parents or parents' parents do something that now sin is being manifested in his life, right? I love Jesus' response because notice what Jesus said in responding to the individual. He said, um, Jesus answered them in verse 3, it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but I love this, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, why are you saying that, preacher? Because I know some of us in here have found ourselves in predicaments, in conditions, in circumstances where we might, may, may be an addiction, it may be a stronghold, it may be whatever the calamity is, we find ourselves in this thing and we say, this thing is going to destroy me. This thing is going to take me out. This thing is, is, is not working itself out. I stopped by long enough to let you know that through the lens of God, this is good news, wherever we find ourselves, whatever it is we're going through is not designed to kill us, but it is designed to bring us to a relationship with God and so God can be manifested in our lives. Come on, say amen if you believe that. Let me, let me help you with that. Let me help you with that. Because I have yet to see any situation that God says, oh my gosh, I can't fix that one. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Come on. Uh, I, the God that I serve is a supernatural God. Come on. Grandma and them might not have great theology, but they say things like no mountain too high. No valley too low. There's no place where God could not go. So listen to me. Your circumstance was not designed to kill you, but it was designed so that God can get glory through it. And we're going to talk about that Wednesday because that can create some, some very um, um, controversial conversations as we talk through this. Why does God have to take me through all that for him to do what he needs to do? Well, it takes all that because some of us are real knuckleheads. I wish I had somebody in here. And, and, and God has to take us through some things so we can see him. So lock into this. It's not designed to kill you. It's not designed to kill us, but it's designed to bring us to a relationship with God. Let me help you with this. Last I checked, there's not a dead person that's in my midst. 
And by virtue of fact that all of you are here in my presence, listening to the word that God has for you today and worshiping God like we just finished doing is indicative of the truth that you are here because God did something in you to draw you to a relationship with him. Make the mistake of acting like church, a phony church people because that's none of you in here. Don't nobody in here say to me, preacher, I don't know who you're talking about because I haven't been through anything. Stop lying. Can we be honest? Your problem might not have been mine and it might not have been your neighbor's or it might not have been the next person. But truth of the matter is you've been through something. And I'm confident in saying the thing that you've been through drew you to a relationship with God or at least pressed you to a point to want to seek God, which is why you're here today. I wish I had somebody. Don't make the mistake into thinking that you're here accidentally. There's something, there's a desire, there's a press, there's a void. There's something happening in you and happening in me that we've been through certain things that at the end of it, we ended up seeing God. So here's what I want to say. It seems to me what God did worked. (laughs) Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, looks like it worked on you. (laughs) Yeah, because you're here. Amen. He gets the glory. He gets the glory. He gets the glory. Come on. He gets the glory because God. So here's what he said to his disciples. This blind man, the issue with him is not so much the sin But it's not what God can do as a result of where he finds himself. And that's a pivotal statement because a lot of us, when it comes to ministry and engaging the world and engaging the community, we get hung up on how deep the people find themselves in their situation. And it's not about how deep they're in. It's all about what God can do to get them out. Does this make sense? So here's what Jesus says. Here's what Jesus says. And I'm just kind of setting up what we're going to talk about. He says in verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. And he says this in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So here's what he's saying to his disciples. Hey, guys, we're called to minister, and as long as the light is here, it's daytime, we must be about the Father's business. So now notice this. Verse 6 says, having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud from the saliva, Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And he went and washed, and then he came back. What? See it. Let me read that one more time. So, having said these things, I want you all to track with me. Listen up. The disciples, he was going by. He saw the blind man. The disciples see them. They engage Jesus about the blind man. And then verse 6 says, when he finished speaking, he spit on the ground. He made um, mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Verse 7, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, don't miss the details that's nuanced in this text and in these verses. Don't, don't stay on the surface, but go a little deeper with me. And notice with me, this man, when you look at how the narrative unfolds and how it develops, he is sitting here and probably in Jewish culture, positioned next to the synagogue, begging for arms, doing his thing, doing his thing, just minding his own business, Ain't bothering nobody like they would say, like how we would say, I ain't bothering nobody. I'm just doing me. And then it seems like Jesus now is on his ministry journey, and he's walking with his 12 disciples. And as they're going along, the disciples look up and they see the blind man probably in a distance. He might be nearby. But when you look at the text, the focus of the text is just Jesus and his disciples, And the conversation and the dialogue that's pursuing as a result of the text is Jesus and his disciples. And they're saying, who sinned, did he or his parents? And listen to what Jesus' response is. Neither him nor his parents, but this is done so God can get the glory. And in verse 7 is pivotal for me because notice this in verse 7, there is no mention of the man saying, In the conversation, hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There is no mention in the text 
of the man saying, hey, Jesus, heal me too. There is none of that. It's as if they were speaking and the man doesn't even exist. And without the man's request, Jesus spits on the ground, takes the mud and rubs it up and makes these spitballs. Then he goes over to the blind man without the blind man asking him and puts the mud and then says to him, go and wash. Come on, is this making sense? The man never asked Jesus to heal him. He never asked Jesus to intervene. But it as if because of the timing, the season, the, 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 the oracle, God just goes up to him without his permission and heals him and then his ministry begins. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say, when I looked at this scenario, I think the story for most of us in here, it's just like that. Here we were minding our own business. Y'all not hearing me. Doing us. Come on, y'all. Having fun being all about us. And then Jesus is on journey with his disciples, and he passes by. And there you are doing you. There I am doing me. And without me asking him to heal me, all of a sudden, because it's his time, and because things are being done for the glory of God, he interrupts your plan, and he goes over to you, and he heals you on the moment independent of you, and says it's time to do ministry. I like that because if it were up to me, I'd still be doing me. But because of the timing of God, he, he, I don't have to ask him. He uses us when he gets ready to use us. Is this making sense? And, and you're here, you're here, you're here because he interrupted your party. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't still don't get what I'm saying. So, so, so let me help y'all with this. Here you were last night just chugging away with your boys and with your girls. Come on. There you were just doing you. You know? Making it happen. Come on. You, you just doing you. <laughs> there you were. This Colorado. <laughs> y'all not hearing me. <laughs> Come on, y'all. And depending on what neighborhood you're in. And how much money you, y'all not hearing me. And, and there you were doing your other business. And, and Jesus, before the foundations of the world, knew you. Y'all not hearing me. And he ordained you to be something else. Then all of a sudden, he passed by. And without your permission, without your permission, he interrupts your party. And this is what it looks like. The next day, next day. Man, I don't feel like doing that no more. <laughs> oh, come on, talk to me, y'all. Girl, you going to cash bar? I don't know. That's getting, oh, oh am I meddling now? Yeah. Oh, that's kind of getting old. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? <laughs> you going to the green leaf? You go, no, I'm tired of doing that. And you don't understand what happened. Jesus was having a conversation with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost saying, I didn't create her for that. I didn't create him for that. I didn't create them to do that. So without your permission, he interrupts your party. Why? It wasn't meant to kill you. It was meant for God to get the glory out of it. Does this make sense? Here, here's the thing you got to understand. Left to my own devices, I would still be doing me. I think the same is true of you. Left to your own devices, you'd still be doing you. Come on. And the only reason I think you and I are here this morning is not because we were desperate for God. It's not because you were hungry for God. It's not because we thought we were all that. It is because God took the initiative and pursued you and pursued me because we have been called to minister in our place of deliverance. So guess what? He goes into the muck and the mire. He goes into the dirty places. He goes into places we have no business being. And he is interrupts the party, then he says, go back in now that I brought you out. Lord have mercy. Turn it in and say, neighbor, looks like he got you out too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Are you with me? Amen. Just, 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 just for a brief minute, go back in your mind 
on what it used to be. Just don't stay there long. Don't stay there long. You kind of you kind of get what I'm saying. Don't stay long because he brought you out. But but you know it felt good when we were there. Oh come on y'all. Ooh, ooh. Yeah see y'all y'all yeah yeah, yeah. amen. <laughs> we knew what it was like right. But God interrupted us for his purpose. And then now he says, you are called to minister at your place of deliverance. So here it is, here it is. And I'm going to go through these three points I want to share with you. Is that he didn't interrupt your party so you can feel I'm better than you. He didn't interrupt our party so we can look down our nose at those who are where we were. Come on, y'all. He didn't look down, interrupt our party, so we can continue the religious bastion of condemning people whose party he has not interrupted yet. You get it? We're called now to be like Jesus, to go back into our places of deliverance, to bring people out. So they can have an encounter with God. Just like he came to get you and to get me, he wants us now, based on the body being one with many members, us have giftings, going back in and getting others out to bring them to a relationship with him. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen if it makes sense. So now let's walk through, let's walk through this text. There's a couple of things that I want you to see now as a result of the text um, so we can move to where God would have us to go. Um, if we can change the next slide, I want you all to see that this isn't changing. So notice this. So Christ's impact on our life, notice this, it should draw others to our relationship with him, okay? So in other words, when I come to Christ and I encounter Christ and Christ impacts me, the goal of the impact is that when others see me, it now draws them to a relationship with him. So two, two sub-points underneath of that that I want to talk to. Number one, once we encounter Jesus, listen to this, the world or others should recognize a change in our lives. Are you hearing me? They should see a change in our lives. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at verse 8. And let's walk through this. I want to read verse 8. Notice what it says. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Let me keep reading. Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? And he said, and he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Look at verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying. Okay, now pause this, pause this. Th this is humorous to me because understand with me. Assume it's, it's, well, the text gives us data. It was Sunday. So here's what you need to know about Sunday on the Sabbath in Jewish culture. For him to get where he was, someone had to help him. Why? Because he was blind. Are you with me? And if you read the story of Bartimaeus being the beggar that was begging for alms, I am, I'm led to believe there's no difference between Bartimaeus' scenario and this man. Here he was sitting probably at the entrance to the temple with his rug spread out and his stick sitting there. And he was sitting there begging alms for the poor alms for the poor as people were making their entrance into the temple. Why? Because he could not provide for himself. So lock into this. On the way to church Sunday, everybody that were going to the synagogue and going into the church door noticed him as a blind beggar begging. The next day is commerce day. And everybody's busy going to work. And the crowd is walking to work. And somebody in the crowd, isn't that the dude we saw Sunday at church when we're going to church? And somebody said, nah, bro, that just looks like him. You sure? And here's the dude walking. Yes, yeah, me. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, can't be him. Can't be happening. They're like, didn't we see you yesterday sitting at the porch begging arms? You did. What happened, bro? This fellow named Jesus, man, he hooked the brother up. Yeah. 
This is important. This is important. This is important. Because here's what it's saying. There is no way in your spiritual journey that you can have an encounter with God and stay the same. Ah, you got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. Notice, notice, he wasn't sitting there saying, I met Jesus, but he's still saying, arms for the poor. Ah, no, 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 no. It's a contradiction. When you meet Jesus and he opens up your eyes, something needs to change about you. Your language has to change. Come on. Your walk has to take change. Come on. Your talk has to change. Your behavior has to change. Your mannerism has to change. Assuming we meet Jesus. The reason a lot of people say we've met Jesus, but we're still going through this. Here's what I said this morning. I'm going to say it again today. I don't know that you've met Jesus other than you've met the people in the church. Religion versus relationship. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because you can come to church and you can feel the emotion of the church. You can feel the, 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 the ethos of the church. You can feel what we will call the presence of God in the church. And here it is. We end up worshiping the emotion. We end up worshiping the feeling. We end up worshiping the thing here so such that when we come and we don't feel nothing, here's what we say, God ain't here. Because the high that we come for, we don't get. There's a difference in coming to the church to have church than coming to the church to meet the God of the church. Are you with me? Because the God of the church, he's not concerned with emotion. And you don't have to sing the right song for me to worship God. I wish I had somebody in here. You don't have to pray the right prayer for me to worship him. I worship him because he lives in me. He, uh, and it's a whole different thing. When I encounter him with a relationship versus a religious experience. Here's what religious experience does. I've been going to church for 40 years, but I'm still addicted 40 years later. I've been going to church for 40 years, but I've still got the same sin situation 40 years later. So whenever people see me, I know Jesus and I've met him, but I'm still begging alms. What's wrong with that picture? Why aren't you walking with the crowd saying, didn't you used to hang out on Colfax? Yeah, that's me. Didn't you? you? Yeah, that's me. What happened, bro? Well, I stopped meeting church people and I started meeting Jesus. <laughs> and I started putting my eyes on him. And everything about me changed. Hear me, church. You cannot say we've met Jesus and we have not changed. The world should recognize the difference. Yes, yes, yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. Your neighbor, your family, your spouse, inner circle should see the difference. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen if it does. Very, very important. Look at the second thing real quick. Um, the second point is that when asked about our deliverance, the goal is to point people to Jesus. Why? So they can experience him for themselves. Very, very important. Look at the text. Look at the text. I want to show you this in the text. Look with me at verse 10. And notice what it says here, right? So they said to him, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man called who? Jesus, Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. I went and washed. And receive my sight. Very, very important. Very, very important. This is what I said this morning, and, and, and I'm hoping you understand what I'm saying. Don't make the mistake of going out in the community and saying to people, hey, you ought to come to my church and meet Pastor Felix. I don't have nothing to offer nobody. Can we be honest? All I am is a vehicle and a vessel through which Jesus works. All you are are a vehicle and a vessel through which Jesus works. So be, let me tell you why that's critical, because here's what it is. If, if, if Pascatani has the gift of healing, for example, and then God uses her powerfully in a worship experience to say she's laying hands on people and they're being healed, and we mess around and go God in the community and say, man, you got an ailment, come to my church to meet Katani, right? And then you bring her to her, and then that day God decides not to work through her. You get it? They get depressed. 
they get despondent, they give up. But if we can tell people, come meet the God of Katani. Ah, yeah. That's a whole different story. I love the text because lock into this. Here's what the, the author said, that when he was walking with the crowd and they say what happened, his only response was, Jesus. <laughs> right? Jesus. And my job, your job in ministering to our place of destiny is not to go back to these places and be all that, but simply to point Jesus, people to Jesus because if he can do it for you, he can do it for them. Come on, talk to me this morning. If he can heal, if he can deliver, if he can set free, he can do it for them. So point people to Jesus. Come on, say point people to Jesus. Say it again, say point people to Jesus. Now notice this. To draw others, we must be willing to testify about the goodness of Jesus. Say, so you got to talk about him. You have to talk about his goodness, right? So here's what that means. This, this is very, very important. So when pointing to Jesus, um, because of who we were, listen to what I'm going to say, because of who we were, people will attempt to discredit your testimony. Hear how I'm saying this? Because of who we were, they will try to discredit your testimony. Look at the text real quick, okay? Look with me at verse 13. They brought to the Pharisee the man who had formerly been blind. And the text says it was the Sabbath day and when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Talking about Jesus. We're going to flesh it out Wednesday. But others said to him, how, how can a man who is a sinner, talking about Jesus, do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what, did he, um, what do you say about him and he, um, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. Let, let me help you with this. Let me tell you all how this works. If last night, and I got to clear this up, illustration. Come on, say illustration. Because I don't want nobody walk out of here and say the wrong thing. I know church people, right? Assume for a moment I'm getting high with Bubba. Illustration. And then Jesus is walking by, and it's my time for him to get the glory out of my life. Here I am. You take a hit. I I seen this on TV. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> clean. So, <laughs> I clean it out. Amen. <laughs> Man. Now I don't don't get it twisted because I'm from the island. I know. Don't get that twisted. All right. I love Jesus. Amen. Ain't never done. Don't know what it tastes like, y'all. Some of y'all don't believe me. Holy Spirit, let them believe me. Amen. I just seen it on TV, amen. And then Jesus comes by and he spits on the mud and he touches my eye. My eyes open and I'm following him. Yesterday I was getting high with Bubba. Today comes, I go to Bubba. Hey, Bubba, you need to stop that, man. You need Jesus, Jesus healed me. Here's what Bubba's going to say. Hey, bro, we were just doing this. Less than 12 hours ago, man. Come on, you know you want to take a hit. You kind of get where I'm going with this? And his attempt is going to be to discredit my testimony because of who I used to be. Oh, you got to get this. Because of who I used to be. And the reason I want to make this point critical is because here's what you got to understand. When God sets you free, whom the Son therefore has set free is free indeed. God's deliverance doesn't necessarily work like this. Hey, God has delivered you. Now you need to go away and wait seven days for the deliverance to really take effect before you can go back in. Or you got to spend time. No, 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 no. If God has really done what God has really done, come on, you got to hear me. And God is walking with you. Lock into this. The enemy's job is to fool you into thinking that what God did did not work. And he will use everything possible to remind us of who we used to be. And here's what we do. We discredit ourselves because we buy into the lie. You know you're right, man. Give me a hit, man. 
We buy into the lie because we've been doing it for so long that we don't think God can do it so quick. And we discredit ourselves, and the enemy sits there. <laughs> Got another one. And Jesus comes and sets us free, and he pulls us back in, and we let him. And we let him. Okay? So hear me out carefully, church, as we press on. When God sets you free, we must begin the process of walking it out despite the temptation. Here's how Corinthians says, take every thought captive and submit it to the things of Christ. Notice what the crowd were saying with the blind man that was walking with him. Hey, dude, didn't you used to be at the synagogue begging? Yeah, man, that was me. What happened, Jesus? And he kept walking. Weren't you the one that was sitting there? Yeah, that was me. And he kept walking. Never once did he say, nah, that was somebody else, man. His testimony. And in spite of all the temptation to discredit him, he stood firm. Because the worst thing the enemy will do with you and he will do with me is when we blow it, when we sin, when we fail. He has a way of causing us to live in the failure, to live in the past, to live in the sin. And we discredit ourselves because of what we did. 1 John 1 and 9. If I confess my sin... God is faithful and just to do what? Forgive me and to do what? From what? All unrighteousness. So it's not that I'm going to forgive a little bit. Then if you keep staying right, I'm going to forgive some more. And if you stay right, I'm going to forgive. No, no, no. All unrighteousness. But what he doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily erase our mind from the memory of the failure. We have to take the thought captive and submit it to the things of God and do not discredit ourselves in the failures. You want to know why we do it again? Because we are the ones that are not forgiving ourselves. Does this make sense? When we forgive ourselves like God forgive us, no demon on hell can discredit us from what God has done. Are you with me? Come on, say amen if you believe that. Very, very important. Look at this next thing. So, and you don't have to be, lock into this, you don't have to be spiritually mature to begin the process of pointing people to Jesus. Now, I am a huge proponent of discipleship. I'm a huge proponent of growing people deep in Christ. I'm a teacher by default. That's my dominant gift. So I love growing people up and letting them become who God would have them to be. But lock into this. The most growth I experienced was when I first got saved and in the excitement of my salvation, I encountered people in the world and they asked me questions I could not answer. I was forced to go back and study. I didn't say, let me spend six weeks being this. Let me spend a year being that. No, 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 no. I put my theology into practice and lock into this is in walking it out, my growth occurred. Where you getting this? Where you getting this? I'm preaching from the text. Look with me at verse 17. Look at verse 17 real quick, right? Then we're almost there. It says here um, in verse 17, um, where's that at? Let me just jump in. 16. Um, but some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such sign? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? Watch what he said. Oh, he's a prophet. That's all that man knew. That's all he knew theologically about Jesus. Why? Because he came up in the Old Testament era and all they did were study the prophets. So here's the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish cultures. To them, Jesus was not Messiah. He was a prophet. We know that's not true. That's not the whole truth. He wasn't deep. He didn't say, oh, this is the Son of God who has come into the world to save the world. Remember when Peter said that? He didn't even know what he was saying. So Jesus said, bro, flesh and blood didn't reveal only flesh. But the Spirit, he didn't know nothing. But still, lock into this, he was ministering at his place of deliverance. He began the journey. Say this out loud. Say self. Just begin. One more time. Say self. Just begin. 
couple more things, then we're done. A couple more things, okay? So notice this one. So our testimony of the goodness of Jesus is the vehicle that draws people to Christ, okay? One more time. The testimony is the vehicle. The testimony is the vehicle, right? The testimony is the vehicle. And when people hear the testimony, Revelation 12, 11, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the what? Word of their testimony. It's not to draw them to you, but to draw them to Christ, right? So let's walk this out a little bit because it's very, very important that you understand this, okay? So you and I are the only ones that are qualified to tell others, and notice the word, the true impact of what Christ has done. I wish I had somebody in here. Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? Verse 20. His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. I love this. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, ask him. This is funny to me because it's like they were part of this social entity. And they say, if, if, if Jesus does anything in here, we're going to vote you out. And so because they love the people more than they love Jesus. <laughs> Lord have mercy. 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. In other words, tell us the truth. We know that this man is a sinner, speaking about Jesus. He answered, whether he is a sinner or not, notice what he says, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, but what? Yeah, you get it, you get it, you get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So lock in the mama and them. Here's mama and them. Hey, mama and them, we don't know what happened, but we don't want to be voted out. And lock into the dude. Listen, you, you can argue about who Jesus is, whether he was a sinner, whether he was a son of God. I don't know all that. But what I do know is that I used to be blind, but now I wish I had somebody in here. So something about that man, you kind of get it. I used to be homeless, but he provided for me. I used to be addicted. Now he set me free. I used to be stuck on pornography, but he delivered me. I had a bad marriage, but I wish I had somebody in me. You can argue about who he is. That doesn't matter to me. Look at me. This is important because we go out and there's a sect of people that's trying to discredit Christianity by discrediting Jesus and dumb us get in an argument with them about the veracity and the truthfulness of who Jesus is. He this, he's that, he wasn't this. And we, and no, 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 you don't got to do all that. Hey, look at me. I was blind, but now I see. You can spend all the time. He can open your eyes too. You can't argue with the testimony. Ah. Uh, this is why there's nothing anybody could have done historically to shut Peter and them up. What do you mean, Peter? They were there when they killed him. They saw him die. They saw him be placed in that tomb. They saw him be buried. They saw the Pharaoh seal, the king seal the tomb. And then three days later, they went to that tomb and they saw the stone roll away. And they looked in there and they didn't see Jesus in the tomb. But they know they sat with him. They saw the holes in his hand. They saw the holes in his side. They saw the holes in his feet. You think anybody could discredit their testimony? Say what you want. I saw him for myself. The power of your testimony. Hear me, guys. You and I are the only one qualified 
assuming you've seen him, not church people. Because if you talk about the church people you've seen, when the church person fails, guess what the world going to say? See, that person has nothing to do with who God is. But if you point people to Jesus, they will stand when people fail. Are you hearing me? Because the God I serve never fails. Come on, the God that I serve. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. The God that I serve. And then we'll learn to love people in their failure because the God in us will go pick them up, brush them up, and help them to do it again because such were some of us. Without him, we would be them. Your testimony means a lot. Does this make sense? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the white words of their testimony. Very, very important that you not miss this. Last thing, then, I, then, then I'm going to be done with this because I want you all to get this and we'll move on. Go to the last slide. So when it comes to testifying about Jesus, let the truth of who he is and what he has done speak for itself. When it comes to testifying about Jesus, let the truth of who he is and what he has done speak for itself. I'm talking beginning point, okay? As you grow, you're going to have more to share because you're going to have a deeper knowledge of the Word of God. But don't wait till you've read all of this to begin. Be like the brother in the text. Hey, man, Revelation 4 and 4 said this. What's that? Bro, I don't know, man. I just nod blind now. See, that all you know? Yeah. Who did Jesus? Ask me four years from now, I might find where Matthew is, and I'll bring Matthew. But right now, it's just me and Jesus. Does this make sense? Come on, say Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. Say Jesus. Jesus. Look, at, look, look, let me just, let me just wrap this up real quick, okay? And, 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 and so they go through all this. Let me, let me just read this. Y'all bear with me. Verse 26. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? He's preaching now. Let me point you to Jesus. You know, he don't know nothing, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, he ready to preach, right? And then it says, and they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We'll talk about that Wednesday. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why is this an amazing thing? You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a mind born blind. I'm going to be saying that. But if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in sin, you heathen. And now you're trying to teach us. And they voted him out. <laughs> Look at this last part, then let me stop. And I want to land here. Notice what the text says. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and listen to what he's saying to Jesus now. Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, verses 38 to the remainder of this text is very interesting to me. Because everything that I have said to you, this man is preaching Jesus, pointing people to Jesus, ministering to his place of deliverance. Lock into this. And he didn't know who Jesus was. It wasn't until he got voted out of the church <laughs> that God met him. I'll say it again. <laughs> Every Sunday, he'd go to church, sitting at the synagogue, because they wouldn't let him in. He would see the rabbis walk by. He would see, he had a little bit of word in him because he knew what a prophet was. He was churched. 
And then it wasn't until they voted him out of the church that he met Jesus. I'll say it one more time. Here this brother was, there's Sunday, er Sunday, going to church, singing in the choir, serving on the Ursher board, security, reading scripture, preaching, doing all kinds of stuff. But all it was, it was a religious motion. Y'all gonna get it. And it wasn't until they put him out and he stopped the religious motion that he met Jesus. Because <laughs> religion really ain't nothing absent Jesus. You kind of get what I'm saying? You kind of get where I'm going, right? And, and the reason I want to point that out because... You, like me, I was sharing with church this morning. My wife and I have been married for 38 years. It's been a very, very long time. And the first 16 of those were just a living hell. I mean, it was just bad. It was just, it was just bad. We were best friends. So when the love stopped, we had a friendship. And it kept us from shooting each other. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> but but, but, but we, you kind of get what I'm saying. And, and here's the sad part of the testimony in, in, our, in our, our, our deliverance and God bringing us out. We were leading a ministry. We were pastoring churches. We were doing all that stuff in our marriage wasn't right. Why? Because you were caught up with the religious activity. If you saw me, I had a suit on with a matching tie and matching socks with a Louis Vuitton b- uh, briefcase. Come on, y'all, with, with, with the matching pen and she had on the hat that was so big you couldn't see her eyes and the white gloves. And all. But we looked the part. And then we'd go home and grab each other by the throat. I'm going to kill you. I'm my daughter. And I'd go, hey, Sister Jones, how you doing? God loves you. Bless the Lord. Paying the phone up. Yeah, again, right? And come to the religious experience, faking the funk every single time. It wasn't until they kicked us out of the church that we met Jesus. Are you hearing me? It wasn't until then that we met Jesus. And a lot of you are here faking the funk and you haven't met Jesus. I wish I had somebody yet. It's time to stop. Because the world is dying and going to hell. And we're called to minister in our place of deliverance. And the reason they call the church folk hypocrite is because they see the people who haven't met Jesus yet play in church. Come on, talk to me. And they know what phony look like. We might fool each other, but we're not fooling them. But when you met Jesus, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Here this man was doing all that stuff. But when he met Jesus... Lord, who are you that I may believe? And when I say a relationship is completely different, it gives you another level of anointing for your place of deliverance. And it's time out. Are you hearing me? For the people of God to stand up and be authentic people of God. Does this make sense? Point to yourself, say, self, I have been called to minister at my place of deliverance. That's a starting point. That's a starting point. That that doesn't mean it's going to end there. But if you're wondering where do I begin, and you know Bubba and Steve and them, that you just say, man, I've just been praying for you. That's all you got to say. Put the phone down. Don't get deep. Don't get deep. Because they'll call you on some stuff. You kind of get it? And let God start doing the work of drawing people to a relationship with him. And you will be amazed at what God will do. Now, don't get it twisted. Because Pastor Tani and I have been married 30 30 years, doesn't mean we don't argue no more. Amen. We just don't call it arguments. Spiritual conversations. Kind of, we spiritualize it a little bit because we're a little deeper. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> and then we can pray afterwards, amen. <laughs> Just kind of keep it clean. But before the Lord have mercy, that religion will do some stuff to you. It'll do some stuff to you. It'll do some stuff to you. And you are here as members of the body. 
that God wants to use, don't let the enemy take your anointing away. Don't let him plant seeds of discords and thoughts of doubt in your mind that renders you powerless for ministry. The world needs you. Your family needs you. Your job needs you. Jesus stopped by on the journey with the conversation he was having about you without your input and went and touched your eyes without you even asking him because he said enough is enough. Now it's time to begin working with him. Does this make sense? Bow your heads with me. Come on, worship team. Let me apologize for the time, but be patient with me. Lord, we thank you for you. Move in this place, God. We know the hours are a little late, God, so gracious and grace people are just to hear a little more. Because <sighs> somebody here needs you. Somebody here might be saying, Lord, save me. Somebody here might be saying, Lord, forgive me. Somebody might be saying, Lord, thanks for calling me. So Holy Spirit, draw them to a relationship with you, God. Draw them to a place with you. Draw them to a place where they get to know you in the pardon of their sins. Heal, restore, fix, do only what you could do. Have your way, God. We thank you for who you are and what you would do. You're a gracious and wonderful God. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.